Groundwater Permeability and Seepage Part 2. This is a schematic of a coffer dam. A coffer dam is a watertight structure, usually of steel sheet pile or concrete board pile walls, pumped dry to enable construction work to be carried out within. Seepage of water within the silty sand induced by the process can be considered as a two-dimensional seepage problem. The main issues to consider in a problem such as this are what is the flow rate Q around the wall and into the excavation? This will dictate pumping requirements. What are the resulting pore pressures on the wall? These are important for the wall design itself. And will the seepage of water affect stability? In other words, will the ground between the walls fail? We can apply some maths to two-dimensional seepage theory. Our starting point is to consider two-dimensional flow through an element of soil with dimensions dx and dz in the plane of flow. The velocity in the x direction is vx, while the velocity in the z direction is vz. vy into the page is zero. If the element does not change volume and water is incompressible, then it can be shown quite easily that dvx dx plus dvz dz equals zero. And this is known as the equation of continuity in two dimensions. <clears throat> the values of vx and vz can be written in terms of the permeability and hydraulic gradient using Darcy's law as shown. We now define two new functions, a potential function phi and a flow function psi, both of which are a function of x and z. In the case of the potential function, d phi dx is defined as vx and d phi dz is defined as vz. In the case of the flow function, minus d psi dx is defined as vz, whereas minus d psi dz is defined as vx. If these are incorporated into the equation of continuity, both can satisfy the Laplace equation, an equation that also features in electrical, magnetic and temperature problems. Using these equations, it can be shown that they represent a family of equipotential lines and a family of flow lines, which are orthogonal or at right angles to each other. This is illustrated in the diagram. The red lines are equipotential lines, lines of constant total head, and the blue lines are flow lines. The head dropped between each pair of equipotential lines is constant. The flow through the channel between each pair of flow lines is constant. This is the basis of constructing what are called flow nets, a graphical technique to solve seepage problems such as the cofferdam problem on the first slide. Here is an example of a flow net for seepage underneath a dam with a sheet pile cut off wall at the upstream end. The seepage is caused by the head of water H. The flow lines and equipotential lines are indicators on the flow net. In practice computer programs are used nowadays to generate the flow net. However, there's always the danger with computer software that people take the results as gospel without understanding the software's basis or questioning the output. Flow nets can be constructed quickly as a check on more sophisticated analyses and therefore have value. One important use of flow nets is to help understand the boundary conditions for a seepage problem as these will influence flow net construction. In this example, the top soil surfaces on either side of the dam are equipotential lines, lines of constant head. The upstream and downstream sides of the cut-off wall and the underside of the dam are flow lines, 
the bottom boundary of the silty sand is also a flow line. <coughs> when constructing flow nets, there are a few rules which must be obeyed. Number one, flow lines and equipotential lines must be at right angles to each other. Number two, the flow lines and equipotential lines must form what are called curvilinear squares. In other words, the average dimensions delta S and delta N should be the same. No two flow lines can cross each other, as no one molecule of water can travel in two different directions. No two equipotentials can cross, as no one point can have two different values of total head. To calculate the flow rate, flow rate from a constructed flow net, we need to derive a formula that we can use. Darcy's law gives that the change in flow in one channel, delta Q, is AKI. The area A is delta N, the width of the flow channel, times one meter into the page, times K, times delta H over delta S. Delta N and delta S are the same, so they cancel on account of the curvilinear squares. The total flow is the sum of the flows through all of the flow channels. If the number of flow channels is n subscript f, then we get that the total flow is nf times k times delta h. The total head difference h is the number of equipotential drops, n subscript d, times the head delta h dropped across each. If we rearrange for delta h and substitute it into the equation for flow, we get the equation in yellow that Q is equal to K times H times NF over ND. In our earlier example, you can count the number of flow channels NF to be four and the number of equipotential drops ND to be 14. Bear in mind that it's the number of channels that you should count and not the number of lines. We can use flow nets to calculate pore pressures simply by rearranging Bernoulli's equation to give u is equal to gamma w into h minus z subscript e. Starting on the right, z subscript e is the elevation head relative to a datum line. And the datum is usually taken as the downstream water level. So z subscript e can be negative. On the left, H is the head at any point in the flow net and can be, can be calculated using the formula little h is equal to large h into 1 minus little nd over big nd, where large h is the head difference between both sides of the wall that's driving the seepage. Large nd is the total number of equipotential drops and little nd is the number of equipotential drops passed to reach the point of interest. An example of how this is implemented is shown in this slide. Choosing a point on the upstream side of the sheet pile marked by the red dot. Head has been lost over two of the 14 squares. So the total head is 10 meters times 1 minus 2 over 14, which is 8.57 meters. The elevation head is measured directly relative to our downstream datum, which is minus 6.54 meters. And therefore, our pore water pressure is calculated as shown in the bottom right-hand corner. <coughs> 